So open your Bibles if you have them to Nehemiah chapter 8. If you're just uh, jumping in with us, we've been walking through uh, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah as a summer long study. And if you've been with us, you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a second, what about Nehemiah chapter 7? Last week we left off at chapter 6. Today we're picking up at chapter 8. And so uh, what I'm going to do today is give you a very brief overview, like, like as short as possible, a brief overview of Nehemiah chapter 7. I want to encourage you on your own to go read it sometime this week. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what happens in chapter 7, and then we're going to jump into chapter 8. So last week where we left off, they had finished the wall, uh, they had put the gates in and the doors in, and so the wall around the city of Jerusalem had been built, uh, providing them protection in the ancient world. The only way a city could survive is if it had a, a wall around it, and so they had rebuilt that wall, uh, and, and uh, that's where we left off. So now, uh, chapter 7, what we see is that the wall is complete, but the city is empty. So all these people who had returned back from exile, many of them even had been uh, back for a long time, they weren't actually living in the city limits of Jerusalem, again, because there was no safety there. So they were living in nearby towns or surrounding villages, uh, but they weren't living in the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah recognizes that, uh, you know, they, they need people now. They built the wall, but now they need people. And so he uh, basically gives a call to action for people to return to the city, and then uh, he discovers basically a list of all the people who had already returned from exile, and he recaps that list. It's found in Ezra chapter 2 and then Nehemiah chapter 7. And so that's why I'm not going to read through that because uh, essentially it's 70 verses of people's names and families and how many of them returned. I can't pronounce most of those names anyway, so that would be a struggle for me and a struggle for you. Uh, you go read that on your own time. It's all important. It all matters to God. Uh, and, and so I would encourage you to read it, but for today's purposes, uh, that is the the recap of chapter 7. We're going to pick it up actually at the very end of chapter 7. The last verse, verse 73, and that takes us into chapter 8, says this. The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants, along with certain people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, verse 1, this is a strange place to cut off a verse in the middle of a sentence, not sure why that's uh, the, the way it is, but here we go. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, pay attention to that date, it'll matter later, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Verse 4, Ezra the teachers of the, Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood, again, a long list of names I'm not going to try to pronounce. And on his left, another long list of names I'm not going to pronounce. Verse 5. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Let me pause there and unpack a little bit of what we just read. So this is the part of the book. Last week I told you it was a pivotal moment because they were completing the wall. So this is the part of the book where, where uh, Nehemiah shifts from the focus being on rebuilding the wall to now a focus on rebuilding a people. And so that's what's happening is now they're focusing on rebuilding the people. And the first thing that they do in order to rebuild the people of God, to restore the people of God to the ways of God and the will of God, is that they go to Ezra. Ezra is introduced here in chapter 7. We haven't seen him show up all the way through Nehemiah, even though Ezra and Nehemiah are directly connected books. And I want to encourage you, if you have not read Ezra yet, it is a great book and really important book to give you some more context for Nehemiah. So he was a predecessor of Nehemiah and a contemporary of Nehemiah, but he's been silent to this point until now. Ezra, this teacher of the law, this, this priest shows up and all the people come to Ezra and essentially um, plead with him 
to open the book of the law of God, to open the scripture and read it. The first thing that they do in response to rebuilding the people of God, restoring the people of God to God's will, to God's plan, to God's ways, is to beg and plead for him to open up the book. They were so hungry for the word of God. Hungry for it. Desperate for it. And, and I love that the text points out that both men and women were present as well as most likely some children because it says there were others who maybe, you know, weren't to adulthood yet, but were old enough to understand, similar to what we have in this room right now. We have men and women in this room. We also have children in this room. We have middle schoolers and we have high schoolers in this room who are old enough to, to understand and to process. And so all of these people came together from every walk of life and essentially pleaded with Ezra, please read us the book of the word of God. Read us the law of God. We want to know. We want to understand. And what's significant about this is that for many of them, remember, they were living in exile. They were living underneath of a Persian empire that really had no desire for their faith, no respect for their faith, had no need for their faith. And so therefore weren't practicing their faith and they would not have had access to the word of God because of that. Many of them lived far, far away and now they have returned. And for some of these people, this would be the first time in their life that they've ever heard the word of God read aloud for them. They would have had the stories. They, they would have had the, the history from their people passed down. But, but they would have just heard these stories from one generation to the next and never actually heard the word of God read aloud. Can I just ask you, can you imagine? Like, could you imagine not having access to the word of God? Could you imagine right now in this day, in this time, not having access to the word of God and how challenging that would be for you and me to be able to follow Jesus, to know him, to follow him, to pursue him with all of our heart if we didn't have access to the word of God. And now can I just remind you that yes, even still in this day, in this time, there are people around the world who don't have access to the word of God. And we as the church, the global church, need to continue to do everything in our power to make sure that the word of God becomes available to people all over the world. But then secondly, that means for those of us who do have access to it, how dare we take that lightly? Like, like it is so important for us that we don't take for granted the word of God that we have available to us. If you have a smartphone right now, you have the Bible at your fingertips. It's available to you in, in many different translations. It's available in different languages, many different languages around the world. The scriptures are available to you. And I, I'll just say this as well. If you don't have a physical Bible, we want to give you one. See our connection table after service today. Go to our connection center. We would love to give you a physical copy of the Bible. We want you to have the Bible. We want you to have the Bible. These people were so hungry for the word of God. The first thing they did after they rebuilt the wall, rebuilt their homes, moved back into the city is they got Ezra and they said, hey, we, we've heard that you've got a copy of the book. We, we need you to open up the book and read it to us. We've got to hear it. And so from daybreak, from daybreak until noon, for hours upon hours, these people stood, sat, listened to Ezra. Sometimes people say, I preach for a long time. I'm only like, I'm like I, my long ones get like 50, 55 minutes. I get it. All right. But I'm no Ezra. I mean, you're talking about hours upon hours upon hours here that he was preaching. Hours and hours that he was preaching and the people sat and listened. Verse 5 says, it's so, so important, so powerful. Ezra opened the book. Those four words, that one sentence may be the most important part of this message today. Ezra opened the book the book. And as a result of him opening the book, all the people stood up. Ezra praised God. All the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. They bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground because Ezra opened the book. These people were so hungry for it. So earlier in our nine o'clock service, um, my daughter, our littlest one, our um, 
baby girl has a little bit of a cough, so we didn't put her in the kids' ministry today. And so um, I wanted my wife to have an opportunity to worship without um, holding our child. And she's at that point where she's real squirmy and real wiggly right now. And she just wants to be moving. And so I, I just went back to the back of the room today because of that. And I tried to hold her for as long as I could. And then finally, I let her get down. And, and she's at that point where she's walking, but she's walking like a staggering drunk. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Like, that's the, that's the stage we're at right now. It's like, little girl, I don't, uh, you're, you're going to run into something real soon here. But then she would come back to me and I'd pick her up. And, and, and it was amazing me, to me to watch her response to the worship that took place in this room. I mean, th- this, this little baby at this point, like she's, she's just starting to talk, but she really, she doesn't have a whole lot of words that actually mean something. Like she calls me dada, but then she will also call like that chair dada, and then she'll call you dada. So I'm not sure if she knows what that means. She uses dada, mama. The only word we know for sure that she really knows what it means is the word bubble. And that's in response to uh, that really stupid TV show, Bubble Guppies. Anybody else ever seen this dumb little kid's cartoon, Bubble Guppies? She will come to us all the time and just bubble, 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 bubble. That's all she wants. And, and so we know she knows that word. But that being said, she was watching. And, and th- throughout our both services, everybody worships in different ways, but some individuals would stand up and and in response to the truth of the word of God that we sing. I hope you know that. Like the songs we sing are scripture. And in response to the truth of the word of God, people would raise their hands in worship. And this little girl, like, like 18-month-old little girl, is just looking around the room and watching people. And then she would raise her hands. And she doesn't necessarily even know what she's doing. But just, just watching other people. The people of God were so hungry. They were so desperate. That their response, as soon as, as soon as Ezra opened the book, was to worship and to praise, to raise their hands. And not only did they raise their hands, but then they bowed down on their faces, faces to the ground in humility, submitting themselves underneath the authority of the word of God. This was their response. This was their reaction. Because Ezra opened the book as your pastor. If there is one thing that I could encourage you, one thing that I could challenge you with that I think would change your life more than anything else, not just in this life, but in the life yet to come. If there is one thing that I could convince you to do, if there was only one thing that I could ask you to do, and I knew for a fact that you would do it, it would be this. Open the book. Open the book. Be a people of the book. Open the word of God and be in the word of God. Be committed to it and submit yourself underneath of the authority of the word of God. Yes, respond and praise and worship to who God is when you open the book, but also bow down and reverence to God and say, your word is the final authority over my life. Open the book. Open the book. Let the word of God transform your heart and your life. Be a people of the book. Let's go back to the text, verse 7. The Levites, again, a long list of names that I just am not going to be able to pronounce here for you. The Levites, these individuals, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. So, So Ezra's reading. Most likely he reads and then he takes a break. And then these Levites, they come and and they walk amongst the people. And then they instruct the people in the law while they're standing there. Verse 8, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day, listen to this, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing, send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for this is a holy day. We've heard that now three times. That's important. This is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. 
So there is a lot to unpack in, in just these six verses that I, I, I just read. And to be honest with you, I was tempted to, to just try to find a way to preach a message on just these six verses to stretch this series out in different ways. But, but I, I want to remain faithful to the commitment that we've made to work through this in the course of this summer and not over the course of like the next 17 years. And so because of that, I, I'm just going to try to unpack this as, as quickly as I can. But there's so much here. First of all, I want to make sure you notice this. What did the Levites that were named here, what what did they do? Did anybody catch that? This is so important. Let's go back and see it again. The Levites instructed the people in the law while they were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so the people could understand what was being read. This is such an important rule. So, So these people of God, remember many of them, this is the first time they've ever heard of it. First time they've ever actually heard the word of God read over their lives. Maybe they've heard bits and pieces. They've heard stories, but they've been in exile. They've been living in a world that's so far removed from God's will and God's ways and God's heart and God's plans and God's purpose that that they couldn't even grasp or understand what the text was saying. And yes, there were probably also language barriers here. Many of them maybe didn't even speak the language of the text that was being read, depending on where they came from at the time. But beyond that, even those who could understand what was being said as far as just interpreting the language, they still couldn't understand what God was trying to say to them because they were so far removed from his word. And can I suggest to you that we live in a culture that is so far removed from the word of God. We live in a world that is so far removed from the will of God and the ways of God and the, and, and the, the purpose that God has for us that just simply handing somebody a Bible and saying, hey, yeah, good, good luck, go, go read it without providing some help and some understanding and some instruction is gonna leave them clueless. And so let's, let's not beat our culture up with the Bible and, and particularly for those of you who, who have been studying the Bible for a long period of time, there are many people in here who, who you would say, yes, I am a person of the book. I open the book. I've been in the Word. I've been reading the Word. I've been letting the Holy Spirit transform my heart and my life for, for, for months, years, even decades as I've spent time in the Word. It is your responsibility then to make sure that the people around you have an understanding of what the Word of God says. And there are some people who are a part of this church body who God has called you to be teachers. Yes, I am a pastor. I am a teacher. I am a preacher. That is a, that is a big part of my call in my life. But there are many of you who have been called to do that as well. And I love the model that we get here. Yeah, we have Ezra who's reading the book to the, to the masses of people. But then he sends out the Levites to go and, and basically essentially divide people up into what we would call small groups. And then say, hey, do you understand what we're teaching you here? Do you, do you have a firm grasp on the text? Let's make sure that you understand what this means. Let's make it clear so that you can apply this to your life. And listen, that's, that's what small groups are here at City Church. And so here in another month or so, you're going to have an opportunity to get in a small group. And if you're not in one, you need to be in a small group so that you can bring those same questions to the table. And maybe some of you who have a little more experience, maybe this is your call to, to lead a small group. And to help shepherd and care for people as they come to the word so that they can understand the word. I love that the, the, the Levites were making the scriptures clear. They were explaining it so that people could understand it. I remember as a kid, there were times where I would hear people say things like, man, I really, that preacher, he was so, he was so smart. He was so wise. I couldn't understand a single thing that he said. Like, I'm not sure that's helpful. I, I don't think that does any good for anybody. Like, I, I hope, if anything, you criticize me of being too overly simplistic. Like, that, that, that would be a great compliment for me. Because my goal is that you can understand this text and then apply it to your life. This is such an important task. And listen, this is why I take my role so seriously. And this is why we take the teaching of the Word of God so seriously here. I don't know if you know this, but James chapter 3, verse 1 says this. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So there's a, there's a different judgment for those who teach than those who don't. And I'm not trying to scare anybody away from this. I'm trying to say you need to take it serious. All of us should take the word of God seriously. And we should submit ourselves to the word of God. We should spend time in the word of God every single day. And we should let the word of God be our authority over us. 
So much so that, listen, you need to know the word. Not just what I tell you. And, and this, this may be a little controversial. I would rather you be in the word every day than for you to just come to church once a week. Now, now don't get me wrong. I think both are important. I think both and matter. But you need to be in the word so that you can even test what I say. Do you know that that's part of your role? Part of your responsibility is to test what I say through the lens of scripture. Now, I hope that for, for the rest of my life, I remain faithful to the text. I'm not perfect. I'm not flawless. But I hope I remain faithful to the word of God for the rest of my life. But if you're not in the word, I've seen it happen to too many pastors, too many leaders, where they start to drift and shift away from the word of God being authority over their life. And if their people aren't actually in the word, there's nobody to know whether they're being led astray or not. So you need to be people of the book. Please hear me. Open the book. Open the book. Be people who open the book every single day. Spend time in the word of God. Did you notice also the response of the people? to the reading and the teaching of the word. What was their response? They were weeping. They were mourning. They were grieving. And maybe you're asking yourself, well, why would they do that? But let me remind you, this is the people who have been living removed from God's heart, removed from God's will, removed from God's ways. They've been living in exile because their generations before them sinned so grievously against God that they wanted to remove themselves. And God said, that's fine. Then you can go and you can be in exile. And so they've been so far removed from God that they didn't even know. Like they didn't know his will. They didn't know his commands. They didn't know his law. And now they're hearing them and they're being, they're being exposed. Like they're, they're recognizing for the first time in their lives just, just how sinful they are. How far removed they are from what God's heart is for them. And it leads them to this, this place of grieving and mourning and weeping. And I'll be honest with you, I was, I was really convicted by that fact this week as I was studying this passage. Because the question that came to my mind was, when is the last time, Chris? When is the last time that you have been brought to a place of weeping over what you read in the Word of God? Particularly when it comes to sin in your life. When is the last time that you have been so broken that you are so grieved that you are weeping because the word of God has this kind of authority over your life. And I'll ask you the same question. See, we, 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 just, we live in this culture that just wants to cherry pick. Like, like we'll, we'll take and, and, and pick and choose the parts of the Bible that we like, that seem to fit with what we've got going on in our life right now, that seem to encourage us or make us feel good in the moment. But we don't like to, to submit ourselves underneath of the authority of the word and let it speak over us and challenge us and convict us. When is the last time? That when you've been confronted with the word of God, it has brought you to a place of just complete brokenness where you, you would humble yourself to the place of weeping because of what you have read in the word of God and what it has to say about you and about God. And so Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites, their, their response to this weeping was that they came back to the people as, as their leaders. They came back to the people and they said, listen, we get it. Like, we know your hearts are broken. We know that you're agonizing over this. You, you, you have been made aware of your sinful state. And that's going to break anybody. But our job right now is to encourage you, today is a holy day. So, so, so don't weep and don't mourn and don't grieve. Today is actually a day for rejoicing and celebrating because for the first time, for the first time since the exile began, the people of God are in the place of God and they're hearing the word of God. And this is a reason to rejoice and celebrate. And so, so what I want to do here is just, just kind of help you connect the dots because one of the things I hear a lot from people is they, they struggle to reconcile the, the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament. As if they're two different gods. Like the old, God of the Old Testament is angry, he's judgmental, seems to be pretty condemning. And then the God of the New Testament seems to be, you know, kind of soft and, and, and just full of grace. And people struggle to reconcile those two. So I want to, I want to show you here right out of this text how God is consistent from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. And how when we're encountered with the word of God, from beginning of Bible to the end of the Bible, we have the same response and reaction. So the first text I want to show you briefly is in Isaiah chapter 6. It's such a powerful text. 
I wish I had more time for this. Again, I told you I could preach a, a whole sermon on these six verses. And some of you are like, yeah, I think you are actually preaching a whole sermon on these. That's fine. Here we go. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. This is the great prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. This is a vision that, that Isaiah had of God. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. What an incredible vision that he's experiencing here. What a mighty, powerful vision that he's experiencing. And this is Isaiah, the great prophet Isaiah. This is his response, verse 5. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. It's this awareness. Like I, I have encountered the holy, perfect, almighty God and it has made me completely aware of just how sinful and broken I am. I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Now watch this. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Listen to the gospel in this church. Listen to the gospel in this. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. You see the pattern? This is, this is Old Testament. The same God who we see in the New Testament. We're going to go there in just a second, just, but just catch this pattern. Isaiah, one of the most Righteous and holy people that we would ever point to as an example in the Bible. He has this vision where he encounters face to face a holy God and he realizes just how sinful he is and says, I'm ruined. It brings him to this place of weeping and complete brokenness. And in that moment where he becomes aware of his sin, God meets him, redeems him, restores him. Listen to these words. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. That's the God of the Old Testament. That's the God of the Old Testament. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So, so there's this awareness that leads to brokenness and then immediately is met with grace and mercy and forgiveness and then the very next thing that happens is that God says, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And the only right response is, here am I, send me. You're calling me into ministry now. You have a role, you have a plan, you have a purpose for my life. I am totally, completely sold out and surrendered to you. That's the Old Testament. Let's now look at the New Testament briefly. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1, this is Jesus calling some of the disciples. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Genseray, also known as the Sea of Galilee. The people crowding around him, uh, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the, the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. So at this point, Simon Peter has a, has a, a recognition that Jesus must be something special, but he doesn't quite get it yet. Because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me. Listen to this. New Testament. Jesus, the Son of God, the one full of grace and mercy, 
Peter has this encounter and recognizes for the first time he's standing face to face with God Almighty because of this miracle that had just been performed. And his response was to fall at Jesus' knees and say this, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Are you catching the consistency here? Are you seeing the pattern here? For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. Peter has an encounter. Isaiah has an encounter. They both recognize that they are unholy, unrighteous, sinful men in the presence of a holy God and do not deserve to be there. God meets them with grace, mercy, and forgiveness and then calls them in, invites them in onto the mission and says, I have a role for you. I have a purpose for your life. And they surrender because that's the only right response to do so. So let's now go back to the book of Nehemiah. The people were weeping and mourning And so the response of Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites again and again was to say, no, 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 like, like, yes, you're broken because you're aware of your sin. And that's necessary. But at the same moment that you become aware of your sin and you humble yourself and recognize that you can't save yourself, God meets you in this moment. He gives you his forgiveness and he invites you into a life of grace and mercy and joy. Today is a holy day. Today is a holy day. You don't need to grieve anymore. You don't have to weep anymore. Today is a holy day. Your sins are paid for. Do you see the foreshadowing of the gospel right here in Nehemiah? Your sins are paid for. You do not have to weep and mourn anymore. Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Verse 12, then all the people went away to eat and drink and to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy. Because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. This reminds me of the parable that Jesus tells about the prodigal son. The prodigal son who left home, went away, ended up in exile, far from God, far from his family, far from his home, realizes his brokenness, realizes he can't fix this on his own. There's nothing he can do. And so he turns, runs back to his home and has this plan of begging and pleading from this place of great grief and mourning and sorrow to come back and beg and plead to simply be a slave or a servant in the house. And on his way home, speech prepared, the father father comes running out to him and says, I don't have time for your speech. Uh, Today is a day of rejoicing. You don't have time to be sorrowful. I've got to throw a robe on you, a ring on your finger. We're going to prepare the fattened calf. My son who was dead is now alive, who was lost has now come home. That is the gospel message from cover to cover. It's the same God. It's the same God. We have to be aware. Listen, for you to understand how good the gospel is, you have to be aware of just how sinful you are and how sinful I am how broken we are. Yes, it should bring us to this place of weeping and mourning, but I love what the Apostle Paul says. Again, this is New Testament, church. This is New Testament. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he's writing to them in this chapter saying, hey, listen, I'm I'm sorry, but but not really that I offended you and that it it made you upset and that you were sorrowful for my last letter that I, I wrote you. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And and just, again, if you ever think this church is messy, go read about the church in Corinth. Like 1 and 2 Corinthians, then you will think this place is just amazing after that. So he says, I'm I'm, I'm not really all that sorry that it brought you to this place of sorrow. Verse 10, this is what he says. Because godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Worldly sorrow brings condemnation. It brings death. It brings destruction. God's word, listen, this is so important for us to understand. And as you're reading the Bible, this is so important for you to grab a hold of. God's word brings conviction. Conviction. That leads to salvation, but not condemnation. The enemy will try to condemn you with the word of God. The enemy will try to drive you away from God. If you ever find yourself studying the scriptures, reading the word of God, and and you feel like when you're spending time in the word, you want to remove yourself and get further and further away from God, that is not the work of the spirit. You will feel conviction. 
I also say this. If you ever find yourself reading the word of God consistently and you feel no conviction, that's also not the Holy Spirit. All of us should feel some level of conviction when we come before the word of God, but it leads to salvation. It leads to repentance. It leads to this place of awareness of, God, I can't do this on my own. I, I'm too broken. I need you to save me. I need you to change me. I need you to transform me. I need you to work in my heart, in my life. But it should always lead, it should always lead us closer to the heart of God, not further away. There's going to be a level of conviction there. And, and, and we should feel that. And I, I just want to encourage you, like, the more you spend time in the Word, this is so important for us to, to recognize as well. The more you spend time in the Word, the more conviction you're going to feel that's, that's going to make it difficult for you to fit into this world. And so, so let, me just, let me just unpack that a little bit. This week I, I got a phone call from a friend who was reaching out because he, he was frustrated. And he, he said, Chris, um, he said, you're the only white pastor I know in our city who has said anything against this jail being built in, in southeast Fort Wayne. He said, I... I've seen many of our African-American pastors, many of our minority pastors say something about that this week, but, or in the last few weeks, but you're the only white pastor I've seen say anything about it. He said, and, and I'll be honest with you, like we, we've got to get more white pastors involved in this conversation. He said, I, I need your help in this. And I said, well, man, I, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm not paying attention to what other people are saying or not saying. I said, but I'm in agreement. Like, like, when I study the scriptures, when I read what the word of God has to say, like I, I just, I can't come to the conclusion that putting a jail in, in Southeast Fort Wayne, spending $350 million to build this, this monstrous facility in Southeast Fort Wayne across the street from three schools where, where predominantly African-American kids will attend those schools. I just can't get on board with that. I, I don't see the word of God aligning with that. And so, yeah, you're, you're right. I said, but, but why, why, why would you think that other white pastors wouldn't be saying something about this? He said, well, I'll tell you why. He said, because a lot of white pastors, man, like you got to know who's in their congregation. And, and I think a lot of them don't want to be assumed as if they were Democrats. And I said, what? What do you mean assume that they're Democrats? He said, I just, he said, this is one of those issues that like if you speak out on it, people think you're a Democrat. I said, wait a second. You mean people think I'm a Democrat? And he said, well, I wouldn't say that people think you're not a Democrat. And I said, well, I'm not a Democrat. I'm just not a Republican. And he said, he said well, well the, the problem is, like, when you speak up on issues like this, you, you're, you're labeled and you're put into a category, and then people all, all of a sudden start assuming, you've got to understand the, the context of our community. And so that, that can be a tough place for white pastors to be. And I said, well, no, 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 let's go back. I'm not a Democrat. I'm, I'm, I'm a kingdom of God, spending time in the word of God, reading the truth of the word from, from the scriptures and what God has to say about justice, particularly for the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized who end up in our prisons more than anybody else anyway. I, I've got to do something about that. I've got to say something about that. And I said, and just to be clear, let, let me just like clear the air here for a second. Because, you know, a few weeks ago, there was, there was this massive issue that, that took our nation by storm, and everybody was talking about it, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And I, I was specifically approached by, by somebody in our church, and they said, hey, you should be saying more about Roe versus Wade. And I said, hey, listen, I, I'm not telling you whether I should or shouldn't. I'm just saying if I add anything else to that conversation right now, I don't think it's going to help anybody. But we have consistently, from, from the beginning of this church, been a a pro-life, whole life church. And we have advocated for the most vulnerable and the marginalized from womb to tomb, from the beginning of this church till now. And my, my stance on that has been completely clear about that. 
And also, my wife and I have taken this issue so seriously and so personally that a huge part of our call into adoption was specifically the Holy Spirit putting on our heart to say, you can't just talk about this. You've got to do something about this. And we need to care for these children after they're born just as much as before they're born. And everybody has a different role and a different responsibility here. But then I said, so, so let me ask you, like, what does that say about me? He says, well, the, in that situation, you're a Republican. I said, this is stupid. We are getting nowhere. So, so let, me, let me be clear. The more time you spend on the word of God, and the more you allow it to convict you, the less you will fit into this world. The, the less you will find yourself being able to fit into any camp or, or, or align with any. I'm a kingdom of God person. I stand for what the scriptures stand for. That will always be my position. That will always be our church's position. And so it's so important for you to be people of the book. Because there are people who are actually politicians who don't read the book and don't study the book, but will take the book and hijack texts out of the book and try to tell you what you should believe about the book. You need to know it. You need to know what it says for yourself. You need to be spending time in the word of God. I know I'm out of time. Let me quickly wrap us up here. Verse 13 through the rest of the chapter. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. That's why that seventh month is important. Remember, this is just, just so happens to be the time that they're opening the word of God for the first time. And so, verse 15, And that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns in Jerusalem. Go into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters as it is written. So, the people went out, brought back branches, and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was very great. From the days of Joshua, who led them into the promised land until that day. Verse 18, day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days. And on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. So what we just read about here is the people of God, again, reading the law of God and discovering that there was this festival, this feast that God had ordained for his people to celebrate annually, every single year. They had never celebrated it in their entire life. Now they're discovering they're supposed to be celebrating this feast. It was the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. That word tabernacle, if you've heard that before, all it means is simply a temporary shelter or dwelling. A temporary shelter or a temporary dwelling. And so God had given a command to the Israelites to celebrate this festival at this appointed time every year to remember the wilderness journey from Egypt to Canaan when the people actually lived in these temporary dwellings. And so this was a way for them to remember everything that God had done and what he had brought them through. So I just want you to think about the significance of the timing of this festival. The people of God literally just finished building the wall around the city, finished building the temple, and finished building their homes. They could finally move back into their homes. They've been in exile, living in temporary dwellings that were not their home for, for their entire life. And then they come back, they open the word of God, and God says, it's time for you to go camping. You got to move out of your house for a week. You got to go find a temporary shelter, a temporary dwelling to remember what I brought you through. And the people of God were obedient. Sometimes obedience isn't comfortable. Sometimes it doesn't line up with what, what you got going on in your own life. Sometimes it's, it's difficult because it means you have to shift some things around. You have to change some things. You have to change the way you've been living your life, change the way you're doing things. They were obedient. Amen. The people of God heard the word of God. They were moved by the word of God. Brought them to this place of brokenness. Weeping and mourning. Moved by the word of God. And then they were obedient to the word of God. 
I want to encourage you. You need to hear the word of God. You need to be in the book every day. You need to hear the word of God. You need to let the Holy Spirit move you by the word of God and bring you to those places of brokenness. And then finally, you need to be obedient to the word of God. When God speaks, when he tells you, when he gives you instruction, be faithful to do it. And he will honor you for it in the same way that he honored them here. And so my my question for you to, to wrap it up today would just be this. What step of obedience is God calling you to take? What step of obedience is God calling you to take? If you've been a person in the book for a while, what step of obedience? Like, like I, I have this conversation a lot with people where they'll come and say, man, I just feel like I'm not hearing from God. I'm spending time in the word. I'm praying. I just feel like I'm not hearing. I'm, I'm not getting clarity. I'm not getting direction. I just, I just need to hear from God. And if that's the case, the question I will usually respond with is, when was the last time you heard from him? Let's go back to that time. What did he ask you to do? Were you obedient? Did you do what he asked you to do? Because if you didn't, and you feel like he should be telling you something else now, maybe your next step is to go back to the last time that God told you to do something and be obedient to that thing. He's already spoken. Listen, for most of us in here, we have far more Bible knowledge than we need at this point. What we really need is application. We need to be obedient to the Bible knowledge that we actually have. We need to take steps of obedience rather than say, man, if, we, if God would just give me one more like mysterious sign or if he would just show me one more thing, if he would just do one more thing that, that would reveal to me his plan for my life, then everything would be fixed. And God's like, are you kidding? I gave you a whole book. I gave you this giant book and I, I laid it out for you. It's available for you every single day. Just read it and apply it and do it. Be faithful to it. Hear the word. Let it transform your heart and life. Let it change you. Let it move you. And then be obedient. What is that one step of obedience God's calling you to do? That one step of obedience that God's calling you to take. I'm telling you God will honor you for it. He will honor you for it. So three weeks from today, we are actually going to call our church into a step of obedience that we believe he's leading us into. And that step of obedience is that we collectively would, would uh, take on a seven-day corporate fast. And now, um, I'll, I'll be unpacking this more in the coming weeks, but let me just say up front, it's uh, not intended to be a full food fast for seven days. Um, you need to hear clearly from the Lord if that's what he calls you to do, but there will be different ways that we can all participate in this fast. But the purpose of this seven-day fast, it's going to be the last full week of August, is so that we can be unified. As we've been walking through the book of Nehemiah and, and learning from God's word about how he moved his people to fast and pray before he ever mobilized them into action to rebuild the wall, to take on this great project. We feel led by the Spirit to, to, as a church, together, collectively fast for seven days in preparation for the great project that God has in front of us. We've talked about it many times. You've heard about it before. We've got an old grocery store that's going to become our permanent home. There are lots of steps that we need to take. Lots of things that we need to do, but before we do any of those things, we want to be unified in heart, in mind, in spirit. We want to seek God, have clarity from him. So we're going to spend that time, those seven days, praying and fasting together. So for some of you, maybe that will be that step of obedience. For some of you, maybe you've never fasted before in your life. I'm telling you, it's powerful. It's powerful. It's not because of us, but it's because God meets us when we're obedient to him, when we respond to him, when we seek him over and above everything else. So there's going to be an opportunity for us. You're going to hear more about it in the coming weeks, but I just want to prep you now, begin praying for that and for what God's going to do in and through this church body as we move through it. Let me pray for you, and then we'll get you out of here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that your word is living and active. We thank you that you are still speaking through it to us today. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you illuminate your text, that you you convict us. You don't condemn us, you convict us. Lord, I pray that there would be more godly sorrow in my heart, in my life, and in this church body's heart and church body's life. That it would lead us to a place of true repentance and then freedom and life and calling and purpose so that we can respond to the goodness of your gospel. Lord, I pray that we would be obedient to your word. I pray that the the people that leave from this place today 
would, would spend time in your word every single day this week. Would spend time seeking you, hearing from you, and then being obedient to what you call them to do. Lord, we love you. We ask you to have your way, all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. amen.